Very humbled, Mr. Romulus, very humble. Thank you for your kind words, um, especially for putting together this event. I think it's phenomenal. Um, yesterday, I was very taken aback by seeing a nice cruise ship in harbor, the Azura, and then thousands of tourists mingling in the boulevard. I think if the mayor is watching, he should try this at least once or twice a month. <laughs> All right, but anyway, let's, let's push on, let's push on. Um, just teasing. Uh, my name is, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be, be here. Be. All right. Um, my name is Richard Mathias, as Mr. Romulus said, and I really appreciate this opportunity to explain one of my passions, which is beekeeping. Um, I've been an apiculturist or beekeeper for the last 10 years, and from there, I formed a company called Bell Rouge Aperies, and I'm also one of the founding members of the Ionola Apiculture Collective. And I've also been most recently voted in as a secretary of the S Association of Caribbean Beekeepers. Of so we're doing a lot of things apiculturally within the region and in St. Lucia. Um, I would first like to start with a, to captivate what most people think of honey and beekeeping in this short little sketch um, from a, a young lady by the name of um, Sue Monk. So let me just read this to you. We lived for honey. We swallowed a spoonful in the morning to wake us up and one at night to put us to sleep. We took it with every meal to calm the mind, give us stamina and to prevent fatal disease. We swab ourselves in it to disinfect cuts or heal chapped lips. It went in our baths, our skin cream, our raspberry tea and biscuits. Nothing was safe from honey. Honey was the ambrosia of the gods and the shampoo of the goddesses. That's a short excerpt from the award-winning film, um, The Secret Life of Bees by Sue Kid Monk. So this is the rationale most of us have of honey and bees. Bees give us honey and that's all they can do for us. Um, what we're trying to perceive through our project is to add more to bees than just honey uh, for a number of reasons which I will explain as follows. So over the last few years we've seen a number of environmental impacts. Um, climate change, we've felt real-time climate change especially in the region the use of harmful pesticides by the actual agricultural sector, and this has been further compounded by deforestation. Um, the picture on your right, or well, my right or your left, is just from June of this year in Trinidad. Um, so the folks in Trinidad had a little freak rain, flooded out the whole, whole of the community. So I mean, climate change and the effects of deforestation are definitely affecting us all in real time, and we really need to make amends to try and address that situation. And you also have to remember in 2017, we had a situation in Dominica, and also in Puerto Rico, where about 2,000 people lost their lives due to the Hurricane Maria. And this has been reflected over the last four years in our production levels. So our Average as honey yields per hive has gone down from a high of six gallons per hive in 2015, and it's kind of leveled out for the last two years at 2.75 gallons, just under three gallons a hive. So, obviously, from an income revenue generating perspective, we really need to take action rapidly to address this situation. Otherwise, you may not find any beekeepers left in St. Lucia to do the business. So, sorry, this my notes. Yes, yeah, so faced with the challenge, it was clear we needed a new game plan. And what became clear is we needed to look at extracting higher value products from the hive which were less disruptive to the bees and supply and, and supply and help the general health of the bees at the same time. Because what we were finding that we were taking so much honey from a lot of our bees that some beekeepers were not able to keep their colonies through to the following year because they were that stretched to get the honey to earn an income. <clears throat> so 
There are a few products that we can be derived from the hive, such as pollen, bee bread, propolis, royal jelly, wax, bee venom. My focus and that of the Ionola Collective has been on bee venom, developing a tourism project, forage expansion, and the implementation in a of a residual monitoring plan for honey. So as you can see, these are some of the products that you can derive from honey, uh, other than honey from the hive. So there's a wide array of things that are much more valuable than honey that can give you a much better income. Um, okay, so. So with the assistance of Jeff, we have been able to procure our first bee venom collecting device from Europe, and we are perfecting the chemistry behind the purification process and the analysis, while, stimulating, while simultaneously developing our own anti-arthritic cream in a joint venture with a company called Inspiring Looks, which do ag organic hair products and body scrubs. So you may ask, why would we focus on bee venom? Um, raw bee venom on the international market retails between 30 US dollars to 70 US dollars per gram, um, which is significantly much more valuable than honey. Um, so there is a clear incentive to penetrate the market and create a production space for this in the Caribbean. Um, so what you can see here on the, on the screen in front of the hives is the venom collectors. So it's basically a glass plate which has a mild electric current going through it. As the bees enter the hive, um, it will give them a mild shock, which will agitate them to sting the plate, and which the pheromones released from that sting will attract the other bees to sting the plate also. So you'll find all the bees will sting the plate, and then after a period of time, for 45 minutes, you leave that on, you will remove the plates, and if you look on the other slide, you'll see me scraping off some bee venom, which forms into a powder at a later point in time. Um, so this is a much more lucrative business than harvesting honey. Okay, so let's just talk about a little bit about bee venom and the uses of bee venom. Um, bee venom is used in the pharmaceutical industry to recover from many major diseases. Bee venom is used for the treatment of rheumatic diseases, multiple cirrhosis, rheumatic fever, high blood pressure, sciatica, various skin conditions and burns, among others. According to Russian researcher Stefan Bogodon, bee venom can cure cancer and destroy the AIDS virus. Bee venom has numerous theropathic applications. It is stimulating to infect the hearts and muscles and also controls cholesterol levels in the body, along with having antibiotic properties. In the cosmetic industry, there are various high-end skin products and moisturizers that contain bee venom. So, We've just listed some of the, is the issues, health issues that you can have that bee venom is used to um, treat. Um, and you can see the nice picture of the lady. They actually use, make bee venom masks. It's like a blowtox and it will take out the, the wrinkles in your eyes and so forth. Um, it's like a, it, the white blood cells, what will happen is that when you place it on your skin, it will pull the white blood cells to your skin and it will not give a swelling effect, but it will, um, the white blood cells will start to try to fill the area where you apply the mask to. So it does make you younger. So all you ladies out there who want to get a little younger, soon will you try some bee venom, um, bee venom uh, mask. Um, moving on a little bit. Also with the assessments of Jeff, we have had our honey samples from St. Lucia tested in the Farm Institute in Martinique for various for, uh, pesticides and the use of antibiotics um, so, so that we can pursue entry into the European Union market. There are only two countries in the Caribbean that can export honey to Europe. Um, one is Jamaica and the other one is Cuba. These are the only two countries in the Caribbean that have a residual monitoring plan in place that they can export honey legitimately to these foreign markets. So, and also, as well, if you want to, to attract direct investment, direct foreign investment into the apiculture industry, people that would invest from it from overseas would need to know that they could get their product out if there's honey they're looking for, that they can get this honey out into their home markets. 
So this is one advantage of pursuing that line as well. Um, another thing in our project that we are doing uh, with the help of technical partners and Jeff, Ica and Cardi, um, we have propagated a number of different plants um, and we've looked at a number of different perennials which are very important for combating climate change. One of the issues that we have is that much of the plants, the trees that we uh, bees forage on, are very delicate flowers. And once you get these very heavy rains that we now get, we've now grown accustomed to in St. Lucia, these flowers will now you'll find them on the floor, which are no use to the bees. So plants such as coconut trees are very good perennials. They will stay in flower year round, and they are a great source of pollen for the bees. And pollen is a great um, very important to the diet of bees, especially for brood production. So it's very important. So what we're trying to do is we have s some lots of land, eight acres, ten acres of lots of land where we do have bees, which we're trying to uh, in propagate coconut trees on this land, also integrated with other crops such as Christophene. Christophene is a very good source of nectar for bees. Um, this is another perennial. Um, to every one female flower, there's 10 male flowers. So it's a lot of nectar being produced from these flowers year round. So if we can create an environment where there's a high concentrations of pollen and high concentrations of nectar, when the other naturally occurring uh, forage is not available, we will have a source to produce for the bees as well. So this is what we're doing with Ica, with the season of Ica and Cardi at the same time. Um, Last but not least, apitourism or tourism, so to speak. Apitourism can be described as a form of niche tourism that involves bees and beekeeping as a central focal point. St. Lucia's tourism arrivals for 2017 were record-breaking, reaching just over one million, uh, with 600, just over 600,000 cruise ship passengers and a little under 400,000 stayover arrivals for the year. This presents a massive opportunity to offer a new, unique, unique experience for visitors to the island. Um, so we have all these tourists coming through and they've got very traditional tours that they're partaking in. And there's a lot of people that come to the island that are very interested in apiculture, interested in the beekeeping experience. The best gift you could give somebody who's coming to your island is a pot of honey. Honey is the flavor and the taste of your country. Um, so it's a unique way to spread your, your, the essence of your country and to introduce people to apiculture. So what we've done, we've partnered with Cox and & Company and we're developing two tours. Uh, one is the Api Excursion, which is basically a two-hour tour to our central facility in Castries where we have our processing facility for apitoxin, for honey, um, and also we do instrumental insemination of queens at that location is there as well. So we would have a full range of things that you could see about bees in many different ways at that location. And we also have uh, what we call the Apiculture Safari, which is a four-day four -day tour of the island where you visit different apiaries and different beekeepers. And we encompass that with some beaches and some food and the different usual things you would see on a standard tour. So. And all this is being done with the assistance of Jeff and their vision. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. Ladies and gentlemen, the gods used it. The pharaohs used it. We are using it. And we want maximum funds from it, right? That's right. That's right. The ambrosia. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Comments, questions? Yes, brother. Yeah. <clears throat> what are the factors that prevents us from joining Jamaica and Cuba in exporting our honey to the European Union? If any, and what, if anything, anything is, is, is being done to address that situation? Um, well... Uh, we need to put in place what is called a residual monitoring plan, which is an agreement between the European Union and the government of St. Lucia 
of how particular products, animal products being exported to the country, how they'll be monitored on the home territory. So for honey, uh, we would have to have participating producers allow their product to be tested periodi periodically by government officials to ensure that there is no contamination. We need to have proper record keeping of your apiary sites, proper record keeping of your application of different chemicals or what you use to treat your bees. So it would involve us really function, really raising the level of the standards of how we do business and to properly document it and to have a set agreement between the government of St. Lucia and the European Union. So the first steps in us doing that is us establishing does our honey meet the chemical requirements of the European standards and which we've done the first step, we've had our honey tested from three of our apiaries in St. Lucia. We sent it to Martinique for testing and the results came back very favorable. So that's the first step. Now it's for us now to lobby the Ministry of Agriculture and say, hey, listen, here's the paperwork. Our honey is good as gold. We need to get the process rolling in establishing a residual monitoring plan um, and get the framework put in place. So through Jeff, uh, through ICA, we are trying to get that done, so to speak. Does that answer the question or further clarification? Yes, sir. Oh, all right, thanks. Um, good presentation. I was wondering about your honey venom. Um, are the bees harmed or in any way through that process where you send the electrical shock no. through the system? No. No, no. it's a very, a very mild, no, very low voltage, nine, nine volts. Um, you can change the frequency if you see there isn't anything happening. Uh, you run a, like a 45 minute session. Um, you, do it, you can do it once say once a week, um, you probably collect a little under or over a gram per hive, um, you do, but there is no damage to the bees. And the behavior of the bees afterwards is normal? Um, or do you see the, some erratic behavior? Well, you, you remember you're, you're stimulating the bees to go into attack mode, all right? So you have to be mindful of that. Um, for, as a beekeeper, it's going to get a little hair raising that. Uh, <laughs> during that period, but it's not going to be adversely affected. I mean, we don't have Africanized bees in St. Lucia, so our bees are not as defensive as Africanized bees. Although I just came back from Guyana, um, where we're looking at, because of the vastness of Guyana and the, the, the amount of territory there, we're looking to, and their, their flows of honey will be at a different cycle. So like right now in St. Lucia, we're out of flow, so we're not in production. Where in Guyana, they're actually in production mode in Guyana. So it'd be an ideal time for us if you were to have the project, we could harvest apitoxin in Guyana, process it here for further export onto Europe and the States. So it's really what we're trying to do is to create a hub in St. Lucia for apitoxin to be processed, and then we can push it out fr from this location. Anyone? Yeah, um, let's say we have access to the market that we're trying to get now. Um, will we be able to sustain that supply of constant honey to this market? That is, are there enough farmers in St. Lucia to sustain that market, let's say if you have market in France or maybe in England or even the US? It, it, you know, the example I'm putting is that Remember bananas, sometimes you know, if the supply, the needs and demand for bananas, you know, for certain markets. I hope if we do have this market, can it be sustainable? We have enough farmers in St. Lucia presently. What's the number of farmers doing honey on a large scale? And finally, is there a difference between natural processed honey and organic processed honey? Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, the quantity of beekeepers in St. Lucia, there's probably about somewhere in the region, about 200. 300 beekeepers in St. Lucia. Um, probably the majority of those, at least I would say, at least 80% of them have less than 20 hives. So there's only about 50 or 60 people that are semi-commercial producers. Um, one of the, cons I mean, you can't, contrary to popular belief, um, beekeeping, apiculture is quite a costly endeavor because 
you have to invest in equipment. So every hive, on average, to build a hive is about maybe four to five, four to six hundred dollars. And for you to be qualified, classify yourself as a commercial beekeeper, you probably need to have in excess of 150 to 300 hives. All right, so it is a costly endeavor um, to build your numbers up to that amount. Um, but if we have the residual monitoring plan in place, you will allow investors or from other markets to come in and support the local beekeepers to build their infrastructure and then see what, what is needed. They could help to create the different forage space that is needed. Um, second part of your question, what was it? Oh, natural process. OK, so organic honey, let's see. Organic and non-organic honey. Organic honey is a very complex, is com com complex description because a bee will forage around five square miles. Sometimes even up to seven miles they will forage. So for you to be organic in nature, the apiary where those bees are, seven square miles around it needs to be absolutely no farming at all, or the farmers that are in that area use only organic material. So it'll be very difficult for you to say you have organic, organic honey unless you're somewhere in the Amazon jungle. Uh, it would be pretty difficult to say that. Um, but most people, when they refer to organic, they try to say that they don't use any chemicals in their hives. Um, if they have to treat for things like varroa mite, rather than using a chemical-based product, they will use a natural-based product in this regards. Um, there are also production methods. So the traditional Langstroth hive has a lot of man-made stuff in it. You have frames, you have wax foundation, you have wires and different things where you can, we also experiment with another type of hive called a Perone hive, which doesn't have any wax foundation inside of it. And it basically tries to simulate a natural tree trunk and the bee, which the bees will make their home in. And then you would take that, cut out that honey and you press it to extract, to extract the honey. So it, pressed honey does have a better flavor than, um, centrifugally spun honey, so because it doesn't trap as much air in it. Um, and a lot of the honey produced in Germany, they still to this day press the honey as opposed to using a centrifugal extractor to take the honey. So uh, um, it's a good point. So I don't think we could say we have green honey or organic honey, but we could say we could have as naturally produced honey as possible because much of our forage in St. Lucia is not agriculturally based as it is in Europe and the States. Um, so, I mean, a lot of the plants, you would use the, the Savonet tree, the Capes tree, the Glory Cedar, um, T-Bomb, and a whole host of natural plants that occur naturally in St. Lucia is a source of our honey and nectar, which is why it has such a unique taste, where in America or Europe, you would have, um, you got miles and miles and miles of rapeseed oil. You know, so it has a totally different flavor, a totally different taste. And they can, like you've got the manuka honey, you've got miles and miles of manuka forests in New Zealand. All right? So it's very difficult for you to, s why we have our honey is very unique, I think, in the Caribbean, because it's got many different bouquets. So, you know, in the early part of the year, you'll get all your nice, um, your early flowering plants, like your glory cedar, your capesho flower early in the year. So these are all just normal trees, but they have a beautiful um, perfume. And in the latter part of the year, your, your fruit trees will start to flower. So you'll have a more um, fruity taste to your honey. So it, it all depends on what you're looking for.